To begin this chapter, let's take a step back and consider what we know so far. Recall from previous chapters that we grouped the brain into four broad areas, the brainstem, the cerebellum, the diencephalon, and the cerebrum. Recall also that the cerebrum we differentiated into three broad areas, the cortex, white matter tracts, and subcortical structures, including the basal ganglia, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. In this chapter, we'll focus on the cortex. Specifically, we'll talk about a way of grouping the cortex into four broad lobes. When talking about the cortex, it's important to point out that you can divide it any number of ways, depending on your purpose. Here, we're going to differentiate between four areas of the cortex we call lobes. The frontal lobes, the parietal lobes, the temporal lobes, and the occipital lobes. These lobes all do different things, although they're closely related. Each lobe has rich connections with several brain structures, all the way down from the brainstem, you know, cerebellum, the diencephalon, and other cortical areas. But it's this last piece, its connections with the cortical areas, that are perhaps most relevant to this discussion. With each lobe that we discuss, we'll make a distinction between two broad areas. The primary area, which is a dedicated area that processes very specific kinds of signals, either motor or sensory. And in contrast to that, broader association areas that take that basic signal and turn it into a more complex, meaningful experience. With that in mind, let's begin by discussing the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes consist of the front one-third of the cerebral cortex. Now, given its size, it's perhaps not surprising then that the frontal lobes are involved in a wide range of functions, including planning, organization, and emotional regulation, to name but a few. The frontal lobe can be differentiated between its primary area, in this case a primary motor area, and several association areas. Let's talk about each of them, beginning with the primary motor cortex. The primary motor cortex is the most posterior part of the frontal lobe, and it's a thin strip that runs parallel to the central sulcus. Interestingly enough, the primary motor cortex consists of a direct mapping for every muscle that it controls in the body. We call this the motor homunculus. Now, that mapping is slightly disfigured. You might think that the relative size of the cortex area dedicated to a certain muscle group would correspond to, say, the size of the actual body part that it controls. If that were true, you'd expect a larger area of the cortex dedicated to processing something like your torso. Instead, the motor homunculus is slightly disfigured in that the size of a given area of the cortex is in proportion to the precision of the movements that that area controls. So for example, you have much larger cortical areas responsible for the movement of lips and your mouth than you do, say, of your torso. That's really not that surprising. You just need more neurons, so more cortical area, to do the kind of complex things that your mouth has to do for, say, speech, language, things like that. Lying just anterior to the primary motor cortex are the motor association areas. The motor association areas consist of a few components, including the supplementary motor area and the premotor cortex, but here we'll go ahead and talk about the motor association area as one functional unit. That unit has rich reciprocal connections with several areas of the cortex, including the parietal lobes and the prefrontal cortex. Now the major role for the motor association area is to plan and refine complex movements, but not execute them. Remember, that's the job of the primary motor cortex. Let's think about an example of the importance of the motor association areas. Let's say you're sitting at the breakfast table and you reach out and you grab a cup of coffee off the table. That seems like a pretty simple movement, and in reality it is, especially compared to the complex movements that you're going to coordinate throughout the rest of the day. But if you think about it, even that basic movement requires incredible amounts of coordination of muscles. 
not only the sequence and timing of the muscle execution, but in terms of differential force and velocity of each muscle, just to reach out and grab a coffee cup. So in even the simplest of actions, the motor association areas play a vital role. Lying anterior to the motor association areas is another very important association area for the frontal lobe called the prefrontal cortex. It includes deep reciprocal connections with everything from the brainstem, the cerebellum, subcortical structures, and other cortical areas. In fact, it's perhaps the most widely connected area of the brain. Now, it's possible to further differentiate the prefrontal cortex into additional subdivisions. However, for our purposes, we'll continue to talk about the prefrontal cortex as one functional whole. Given how richly connected the prefrontal cortex is to so many areas of the brain, it's not surprising that it tends to play a vital role in a wide range of very important functions. Notably, it's crucial for things like executive functions, such as planning, organization, goal-directed behavior, uh, as well as emotional regulation, basic reasoning and thought, and, and delayed gratification. That is, the ability to override a gut response for the possibility of better outcome later on. Perhaps the best way to think about the role of the prefrontal cortex is to consider the most famous case of prefrontal cortex damage in history. This is the story of Phineas Gage. Let me paint the picture. It's September 13, 1848, and Phineas Gage is a 25-year-old foreman for a railroad company that's making their way through Cavendish, Vermont. Now Phineas is widely regarded by his employers as a model employee. One of Phineas's responsibilities as the head foreman was to oversee the destruction of large boulders that would often lie in the way of the planned track to lay down. How do you destroy a large boulder? Well, as Phineas could have told you, it involves drilling a hole deep down into the center of that boulder and packing that hole with a combination of gunpowder, a fuse, and sand. And how do you pack it? You use a tamping iron. And a tamping iron is something about like a javelin. It weighs 13 pounds, it's about three and a half feet long, and about one and a quarter inch in diameter. So Phineas did this quite often, but on this day, Phineas forgot one important thing in that mixture. He didn't include sand. So when he took the tamping iron and started packing down the gunpowder and the fuse, it ignited on him. And unfortunately, it turned his tamping iron into a projectile. The tamping iron was immediately shot straight through his prefrontal cortex and out the top of his head. It was said that they found the tamping iron about 80 feet from the site of the accident. So what happened to Phineas Gage? I wouldn't blame you if you assumed he died. Well, that would be kind of a boring story and not tell us much about the prefrontal cortex. So, of course, he didn't die immediately. In fact, not only did he not die, when everybody came running to see what the problem was, Phineas could talk to him. He was clearly a little dazed and confused, but he was conscious and able to articulate what had just happened. He was even able to walk on his own volition to the carriage, which was to take him into town to see a doctor. Now, when he gets to town, the doctor says, you know, I didn't believe him until Phineas started to feel nauseous. And as he bent over to vomit, the pressure of vomiting pushed out about a teacup full of Phineas's brain onto the floor. Recall, I mentioned that the consistency of the brain is something like tapioca pudding and jello, and it lacks a lot of internal structure. So if you ever find yourself with a hole in your head, my advice is don't vomit or you're gonna lose some cortex. Okay, so now the doctor believes that something's wrong with Phineas and he treats him. After about a month, Phineas seems fine. The doctor releases him and Phineas goes home. It's not until Phineas tries to resume the things he did in his past life that the role of the prefrontal cortex becomes obvious. So what were they? First, when Phineas went to get his job back at the railroad, it became immediately evident to his employers that, as they said, Phineas wasn't Phineas anymore. Instead of this young, incredibly mature, well-liked, respectful employee, what stood before them now was a very aggressive, belligerent, vulgar individual 
who had no respect for authority and would no sooner create a plan as abandon it for another plan. That is, he couldn't do any kind of goal-directed behavior and lacked some basic executive functions. So he couldn't be a foreman anymore. In fact, they couldn't even really employ him on the railroad at all. So Phineas does some odds and end jobs, including at some point putting himself on display at the Barnum Museum in New York. At some point, we even find Phineas several years later driving stagecoach in Chile. So he had an eventful life. Now the story of Phineas Gage is important for two reasons. First, and the most obvious, is that judging by what happened to him, it seems pretty clear that the prefrontal cortex is important for several of these sort of executive functions we talked about. Clearly Phineas Gage wasn't as responsible, didn't have as much emotional regulation, didn't have the kind of goal-directed behavior that he once had. But I think just as important is what Phineas still could do. I mean, think about it. Yes, he did lack the kind of overall maturity that he displayed before the accident, but it wasn't as if he had no executive functions anymore. I mean, in the 19th century, simply making your way from New Hampshire to New York City to be on display, heck, even knowing that you could put yourself on display and that people would pay money to see your misfortune requires a little bit of complex thinking. But more important, I don't think you could be a stagecoach driver in Chile without a little bit of executive functioning. So what does Phineas Gage's story specifically and the prefrontal cortex in general perhaps tell us about the organization of the brain as a whole? Perhaps the most important thing that this teaches us is that it's incredibly difficult for us to talk about brain structures and functions in a way that effectively deals with the complexity inherent in the brain. In fact, one of the problems is our language is somewhat impoverished in the way we're able to communicate about the brain. So we end up talking about structures and functions as if there's this one-to-one -one mapping. So we'll say the prefrontal cortex does delayed gratification. Well, that's not quite right. It's true that the prefrontal cortex is necessary for delayed gratification, but in reality, it exists as part of a broader network of brain structures that together give rise to this complex thing called delayed gratification. A good example of this is thinking about starting your car in the morning. If before you started your car, you opened the hood and you removed a spark plug, what would happen? Well, clearly your car wouldn't start. And it would be fair for you to then say, well, clearly the spark plug is important for starting the car because if I remove it, it doesn't start. That's fine. The problem comes when we make a broader leap and say, well, clearly this shows that the spark plug is the area for starting your car. That's not quite right. In reality, the spark plug is part of a broader network of engine structures that all contribute to this idea of car starting. So in that way, the spark plug is necessary, but not sufficient by itself. Likewise, the prefrontal cortex, just like other brain areas, plays a vital role in several high-level functions, including inhibitory control, for example. But alone, they are not sufficient to give rise to that complex function. Okay, to summarize, in this chapter, we discussed a way of grouping the cortex into four lobes, the frontal lobes, the parietal lobes, the temporal lobes, and the occipital lobes. And we spent a lot of time going into greater detail on one of those lobes, the frontal lobes, where we differentiated between the primary motor area, motor association areas, and the prefrontal cortex, which was involved in higher order thinking. We also put particular emphasis on the fact that all these parts are involved in a broader network of brain structures and that any one of them alone does not give rise to a specific function. In that way, any given brain area, not just in the prefrontal cortex, but anywhere, is maybe necessary but not sufficient for a given function. In the next chapter, we'll dive deeper into the other cortical lobes, the parietal lobes, the occipital lobes, and the temporal lobes.